Hello, my name is Shahriyar Shahriyari, and this is a lecture in a series of lectures on introductory linear algebra based on my book, Retrolinear. Uh, the topic of this lecture is the sum of two subspaces. So let's get started with, with the questions that animate this lecture. So um, let's say that V is a vector space, and we have talked about what a general vector space is in previous lectures, and we have two subspaces of V, W1 and W2. Um, each of these are vector spaces in, their own, in their own rights, but they use the same addition and scalar multiplication of V. Now, having that, um, we want to talk about, we have two questions to ask. If you don't know what a vector space is or what subspaces are, look back at, uh, at earlier uh, videos. Um, so the first question is that, what's the largest subspace of V that's contained in both W1 and W2? So I've got these two subspaces. I want a one that's contained in both of them, inside both of them. So there is W1 intersection W2. Those are the, the, the elements, the vectors of the, the subspaces that are in common. And what we want is that we want some subspace inside that, the subspace of V that's inside that. But of course, there always is one, the zero subspace. The, z the zero vector itself is a subspace. It's a trivial subspace. It's in W1 and W2. And therefore, it's in W1 intersection W2. But what we want is that as big a subspace as possible inside W1 intersection W2. The flip coin of that, the other side of that coin, is that we want what's the smallest subspace of V that contains both W1 and W2. So we have got W1 and W2. We want something that contains both of them. So, so we want to go big now this time. But again, we could do that easily but by, by choosing V itself. V is a, a vector space, it's a subspace of itself, another trivial subspace, and that contains both W1 and W2. But we want to be efficient. We want to pick the smallest such, uh, um, some, such subspace. And then our final question in this lecture is that if you know one of these, does that give us info about the other? Is there, I mean, on the face of it, that might not seem um, maybe possible, maybe not, but, uh, but, but there will be a relationship between um, this, the, this uh, um, largest subspace inside both of them and the, um, and the smallest one that contains both of them. So let's start with an example and we'll, we'll look at R3. Often in linear algebra, we look at examples of vector spaces that we are more familiar with to get ideas about how we might go forward. So let's say that V is R3, the three-dimensional vector space. Uh, and, um, and I pick W1 to be um, the set containing vectors of the form A, B, and zero. So every element of R3 is a, three, uh, is a tuple, has three things in it, A, B, and three coordinates, A, B, and, uh, a, B, and C. But now I'm picking those elements where the third coordinate is zero. A and B are real numbers, everything of that form. Um, so, um, and, and W2, I'm going to pick um, all, the, all the vectors in R3, all the points in R3 where the second coordinate is zero. Um, now, W1 is the span of 1, 0, 0, and 0, 1, 0. Why is that what the span means? Span is all the linear combinations of, of those elements. Again, there's another uh, video about that. And um, all linear combinations of 1, 0, 0, and 0, 1, 0 are things of the form A times 1, 0, 0 plus B times 0, 1, 0. When you put combine that, you get that typical element of W1. Both of these two elements are in W1 and their span is W1. And they get, and, I, and actually that's a reason why W1 is a subspace because it's the span of two vectors in a vector space and spans are always subspace. Likewise, W2 is the span of 1, 0, 0, and 0, 0, 1. If you find linear combinations of those, A times the first one plus B times the second one, you get the typical element of W2 and nothing more. And therefore, W2 is also a subspace. Now, um, what, is their, what is their intersection? Because remember, we want something inside that intersection. Um, and uh, those are all the vectors of the form A0, 0, 0, because if they want to be in W1, the third coordinate have to be zero. If they want to be in W2, their second coordinate have to be zero. So to, to be in both, both their second and third coordinate have to be zero. But the first coordinate, uh, there is no restriction on it. And W1 intersection W2 is its sub subspace itself. It's spanned by one, zero, zero. And so 
Um, and so in this case, if I want a, a subspace inside W1 intersection W2, I might as well take W1 intersection W2. And in fact, the intersections of two subspaces is always a subspace. And in fact, we have already proved that. Um, that was uh, the subject of a small video all by itself, that if you intersect two subspaces, you always get a subspace. So our first question in some way, we have already answered. Whenever you have two subspaces, um, um, their intersection is a subspace. That's a fact that needs a little proof, but, but uh, you showed that the zero vector is there, it's closed under addition, closed under scalar multiplication, um, the intersection, and that, so therefore the intersection is a subspace. Okay, uh, let's look, look at the example we did just uh, a little bit more geometrically. So this is R3, we were in R3. So what were the subspaces that we looked at? Uh, W1 was all the uh, uh, vectors where the third coordinate is zero. The third coordinate is the height. So that's really just the xy plane. So W1 is just the xy plane. And if you remember, subspaces of R3, planes through the origin are among the subspaces of R3. Um, R2 was, uh, not R2, the second vector space, W2, was um, uh, the subspace of all those vectors where the second coordinate was zero. The second coordinate is the y coordinate. If that's zero, then you are you have the xz plane. And then we looked at their intersection, and then that, and that's again a plane through the origin, and planes through the origin are subspaces in R3. Subspaces of R3 are planes through the origin, lines through straight lines through the origin, the zero vector, and all of R3. Okay. And then what's the intersection of those? Well, those are all the vectors of the form A0,0. So that means that's the x-axis. You can have the x value be anything you want, but y and z have to be zero. And if you look at it pictorially, um, um, geometrically, if you take the xy plane and the xz plane and find the intersection, the line of inter the, the intersection is the, the line through the origin, and that is a subspace, the intersection of these two uh, vector spaces, these two subspaces is a subspace. So the largest subspace that's contained in two um, subspaces is the intersection. The intersection does the job easily. Okay. Now, um, uh, and, and, and th those were the, the two planes were sort of nice planes, the XY plane and YZ plane. Um, they don't have to be. You could have any two different planes. And if you look at their line of intersect, uh, the, the, the two planes through the origin uh, intersect, uh, in, in a line through the origin. So again, the intersection is always a subspace in R3. Now, this is not a proof um, in general, but we proved in general that the intersection is always a subspace. Okay, now, um, so, so uh, uh, our general fact is that if V is in a vector space and W1 and W2 are subspace of V, then W1 intersection W2 is a subspace of V. I'm just repeating myself. And so this is the largest subspace that's contained in both W1 and W2. Okay, enough of that. So what about the other thing, going big and finding some subspace that contains both of them? Maybe the union does the job. Maybe just like intersection did the job for, um, for uh, uh, finding something inside, the union of the two subspaces, maybe that works. So let's look at the two, same two subspaces. So W1 is uh, um, AB0. W2 is uh, A0B, is, is the XZ plane. Now, what, what is there? Um, uh, we want it's the smallest subspace that contains both of them. So, so we want a subspace that contains both of these planes. Now, is that union, this, the, the, the two planes together, a subspace? And the answer is no, because, for example, 110 is in the union. It's in fact, it's in W1. Um, and the point 101 is in the union, it's in W2, but their sum is not. If you take one, one vector in the union and another vector in the union and you add them, um, they may not, the sum may not be um, in the union. So the union is not closed under addition. It is closed, it does have the zero vector and it is closed under scalar multiplication. If you take anything in one of these subspaces multiplied by scalar, it continues to be in that subspace and therefore in the union, but it's not closed under, um, under addition. And so that will not do the job. Um, and in fact, in R3, since we know all the subspaces, you can give me the answer. If I have a, um, a plane through the origin and another plane, a different, different plane through the origin, 
what is the smallest subspace that contains both of them? In R3, the only subspaces uh, that uh, are are planes through the origin, lines through the origin, the zero uh, subspace, just the origin, and all of R3. So the only one that contains both of uh, these planes is all of R3. So, so uh, the answer got to be a little bit different in general. So let me uh, say what, what we said. If V is a vector space and W1 and W2 su are subspaces of V, then the union does not have to be a subspace. We just saw, uh, saw an example. In fact, it could be a subspace, um, but only if, if and only if, one of the subspaces is contained the, uh, in the other. Um, so if one is contained in the other and you find the union, well, the union will be the bigger one. And the bigger one is already a subspace, so the union will be a subspace. So, so that's fine. The, the, the content of this is that that's the only time where um, the union is, is a subspace. And you might want to do the proof. You may already have done the proof. But here's a sketch of the proof. In this talk, I'm going to give you a lot of ske proof sketches. And the reason is, uh, is, is really because when I teach this class to my students, I want them actually, I want to give these as homework problems and I want them to do these, uh, to complete these. So I'm not going to give you complete proofs. So, so let's see, because I think these are very good exercises to bring together all, all we have learned about dimension, about spanning, about linear independence, um, um, uh, the, the expansion theorem, contraction theorem, and so forth. So the proof is, is, is sketch is this. So again, the thing that you need to prove here that's not straightforward is that if W1 union W2 um, is a subspace, why is it that one is inside the other or the other one is inside the first one? And so the way we prove that is by contradiction. We'll say, okay, let's say that W1 was not in W2 and W2 was not in W1. So let's see if um, uh, W1 union W2 could be a subspace without either one of those uh, being um, one, of, one of those conditions holding. So if none of, neither one of those conditions hold, then that means that there's something in W1 that's not in W2. That's what I mean by W1 minus W2. Things that are in W1 that are not in W2. So pick one of them. Let's X be one of them. And also, since um, W1 is not, not, not inside W2, um, and W2 is not inside W1, pick something in W2 that's not in W1. So pick an X and a Y. One in W1 that's not in W2, and one in uh, W2 that is not in W1. Then you say, well, what happens if you add them? The same kind of thing that happened in the example we did with R3. So let's, let's uh, call the sum uh, U. U is in V, V is a vector space. All of these things are um, elements of a vector space. In the vector space, you can add. So U is an element of V, but where, where is it? Um, now, if uh, W1 union W2 was a subspace, then... Um, uh, X, Y, U, all of them would have to be in W1 union W2. And so could it be that U is in W1? And if it is, then you say that, well, but then what's Y? Y is U minus X. And then U is in W1 and X is in W1. And because W1 is a subspace, it should be closed under um, addition and scalar multiplication. And so U minus X should be in W1. Um, but we specifically picked Y which is u minus x, not to be in w1. So that's a contradiction. So it means that u can't be in w1. Similarly, could u be in w2? Well, then x would be u minus y, and both of these are in w2, and that would make x in w2, but we specifically pick x not to be in w2. So that's a contradiction. So that means that um, um, uh, if, 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 you, if, if you if you have a subspace that contains both w1 and w2, meaning that x and y, um, that uh, subspace uh, must contain things like the sum of these two elements, x plus y, but that can't be in w1 union w2. So, so this means that if you, if you have an element uh, in w1 that's outside w2 and an element in w2 that's outside of w1, then the union cannot possibly be a subspace. Okay, but uh, our, our takeaway point for here is that if you want to... So, so finding a subspace that contains both W1 and W2 is slightly more complicated than finding a subspace inside the, both W1 um, and W2. So there's an asymmetry between the intersection and the union. But our takeaway is that if we want a subspace that contains both W1 and W2, we have got to make sure that um, if I take something from W1 and something from W2 and add them, 
that sum is also um, in this uh, new subspace. That leads us to the following definition. This is, and, and this is the key definition in this lecture, how do you add two subspaces? So subspaces themselves have elements in them, and I'm gonna tell you what I mean by the sum of two subspaces. So the ingredients are that I've got a vector space and I've got two subspaces, W1 and W2. I'm sitting in this vector space V, W1 and W2, I say, well, here's this subspace and here's that subspace. Then what? Then I'm gonna define the sum of W1 and W2, and I'm gonna denote it by W1 plus W2. This is not the usual addition of numbers or even vectors, it's an addition of subspaces. And how am I gonna define that? I'm going to define that by this, this way. W1 plus W2 is X plus Y, is, is the set of elements of the form X plus Y, such that X is in W1 and Y is in W2. So all that means is that to find an element of W1 plus W2, you pick an element of W1 and pick another element of W2 and add them. And you do that every possible way. Every possible way that you can pick something from W1 and something from W2 and adding them together, that's what W1 plus W2 is. So let's look at an example. Um, I'm gonna pick a, a, a vector, a, the vector space of polynomials of degree uh, no more than four. That's what P4R stands for, polynomials with um, real coefficients whose degree is no more than four. That includes the zero, the zero polynomial as well as all polynomials whose degree is um, uh, zero constants, one, two, three, and four. Okay, so I'm gonna pick the set W1 which is uh, made up of some of those polynomials. Actually, these are happen to be degree two only. We are living in this huge vector space of polynomials of degree uh, no more than four, um, degree less than or equal to four to put together, uh, together with the zero vector. But I'm gonna only pick the ones that look like this, that are A, some constant, plus A plus B times X plus BX squared. So you can decide what the constant and the coefficient of X squared are, but then if you, as soon as you decide those, the coefficient of X got to be A plus B and coefficient of X cubed and X to the fourth are zero. So that's W1. And W2 is uh, things of the form AX plus AX squared plus BX cubed. They don't have a constant term. They don't have an X to the fourth term and the coefficients of X and X squared are the same. So those are um, also um, some polynomials. Now, I'm gonna ask you what's W1 plus W2. But first I've got to tell you that W1 and W2 are subspaces. Although the definition of sum actually does work for sets of vectors also. You can make the same definition. It's not as useful as when you apply it to subspaces. So W1 I'm saying is the span of these two vectors, one plus X and X plus X squared. How did I get those? I got one plus X by putting A equals one in the definition of W1 and B equals zero. A equals one, B equals zero. And if you do that, you get one plus X. That's an element of W1. And then I put B equals one and A equals zero and I got X plus X squared. That's another element of W1. And I say that W1 is the span of these two vectors. Watch the video on span if you don't, you don't know what I'm talking about. Um, span means the li all linear combinations of one plus X and X plus uh, X squared. Linear combinations of those means A times one plus X, some constant times A plus X, some other constant times X plus X squared, could be the same, but could be maybe not, and then add them. So A times one plus X plus B times X plus X squared will actually give you that typical term of W1, A plus A plus B X plus B X squared. So W1 spanned by these, and that means because spans are always subspaces, that W1 is a subspace. Likewise, if we look at W2, that's the span of X plus X squared and X cubed. And how did I get those? I put A equals one and B equals zero in W2 in a typical element of W2 and I got X plus X squared. Then I put A equals zero and B equals one and I got X cubed. Now, what are the elements of W1 plus W2? Well, for example, one of them would be, um, there are elements of W1 plus elements of W2, that's the definition. But as an example, we could have something like one plus X plus two times X plus X squared. That's an element of W1, one plus X, two pl plus two plus X plus X squared. That first part is an element of W1 because it's the span of one plus X and X plus X squared. And then plus five X cubed, 
and 5x cubed is an element of W2. So if we combine these, um, we get 1 plus 3x plus 2x squared for plus 5x cubed, and that will be an element of W1 plus W2. But other elements like x cubed itself are also in W1 plus W2. Why? Because remember, every element of W1 plus W2 is something in W1 plus something in W2. How is x cubed like that? Well, it's the zero element of W1 or zero element of V plus x cubed, which is in W2. And that gives you x cubed and x cubed is in W1 plus W2. So what we get is that, um, that uh, the elements in W1 plus W2 are linear combinations of one plus x and x plus x squared, because those are the elements of W1 plus elements of W2. But what are those? Those are linear combinations of x plus x squared and x cubed. So you get linear combinations of one plus x and x plus x cubed plus linear combinations of x plus x squared and x cubed. So if you put that all together, what you're really getting is the span of the linear combinations of one plus x, x plus x squared, and x cubed. And you can sort of prove that in general if you like. So w1 plus w2 is the span of one plus x, x plus x squared, and x cubed. And in this case, this is a, um, uh, this is a subspace itself because it's a span. But that will be the case in general, as we shall um, say next. Uh, so let me tell you about properties of W1 plus W2. I'm not going to prove these because, again, I'm, I'm leaving them to you, but I will say a few words about them. So we have a vector space. This is the setup, and we have got two subspaces. And um, W1 plus W2 is defined to be x plus y. x is in W1, y is in W2. This is what it means. You take something from W1, something from W2, and add them, and um, uh, you get W1 plus W2. First of all, the zero vector is in there. Why? Well, because you get zero from here, zero from there, and both of them are the same thing, and add them, and you, the two things you get don't have to be different, um, and, and, and you get the zero vector. Why is that important? Well, if you're going to prove that W1 plus W2 is a subspace, which it always is, this would be one of the things you would have to prove. Um, Another fact is that, as we saw, W1 is in W1 plus W2. Again, the reason is that you can take any element of W1 and add it to the zero vector, which is in W2. And you get that element is of the form something in W1 plus something in W2. So it's the sum. Um, and, and likewise, W2 is also in the, in the sum. W1 plus W2 is a subspace always. How would you prove that? Well, because W1 plus all of its elements are sitting inside this bigger vector space V, we don't have to check all the axioms of vector spaces. We only have to check three things. Is the zero vector there? Is it closed under addition? Is it closed under scalar multiplication? I'm actually, I showed you that the zero vector isn't there. And closed under addition and scalar multiplication is not that difficult either. Because if you have um, two elements, both of them, um, in W1 plus W2. So this guy is, is something in W1 plus W2. That one is also something in W1 plus W2. If you add them, you can combine like terms and you will get something in W1 plus something in W2. And, and therefore it will be closed under addition and the scalar multiplication is similar. So I basically did uh, prove to you, even though I said I wasn't going to. Um, and um, um, because um, if you want to have a subspace of V, that contains both W1 and W2, you would have to have these guys, these sums of things from W1 and W2. So you have no choice but, but, uh, but having W1 plus W2 in there. But W1 plus W2 is self a subspace. So W1 plus W2 is the smallest subspace that contains both of them. And so this is the answer to our um, original question. Furthermore, the thing we did with our example also ge it is, is generally true. And, and the, I gave an intuitive reasoning for what it is. If you want to write a formal proof, you would have to do so. If W1 is the span of S1, so S1 is a bunch of vectors in W1 whose linear combinations is exactly W1, and W2 is the span of S2, then uh, W1 plus W2 will be the span of the union. So you take the spanning set for W1, the spanning set for W2, uh, put them together. Maybe some of them are the same, and, you've, uh, and therefore you won't repeat them. Um, um, and that uh, uh, collection will be the spanning set for W1 plus W2. It won't necessarily, in the example that I showed you, well, um, it, it's not necessary that after you throw out the duplicates, you will get a basis. That's not necessarily true. 
uh, but, but, but it will be a spanning set. But if you want a basis for W1 plus W2, then you go back to our contraction theorem. You have a spanning set and you will be able to throw out anything that's a linear combination of the ones before after you put the vectors in, 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 in some particular order and you will have a linearly independent set and you will get a basis. This won't this then tell you that, uh, how to get a basis, but it gives you a spanning set, which is almost as good. And what's the reasoning for that? Well, because W1 is a linear combination of things in S1. W2 is a linear combination of things in S2. Now, if you add those, what you get is linear combinations of things in S1 and S2, basically. But whenever you want to prove that it, this set is equal to that, you really have to do two inclusions. Pick an element of W1 plus W2 and show that it's in here. Pick an element in the span of S1 union S2 and show it's there. And so I urge you to write that formal proof down, but I gave you the intuitive reason why, um, maybe a little bit more than the intuitive reason why that's the case. Okay, now among um, sums of uh, subspaces, there are some that actually are nicer than others and we give them a special name and that's a direct sum. So I'm gonna tell you what a direct sum is. So you have a vector space and you have two subspaces, the same thing we've been doing all along. You can find um, their sum. We have just been talking about that. Let's call that U. So U is W1 plus W2. Now it may be that at that point, look at the intersection of W1 intersection W2. Maybe W1 intersection W2 is the zero vector. Maybe it's not. It's possible that W1 and W2 overlap or maybe the only thing they overlap is the zero vector. They both have to have the zero vector because they're both subsp subspaces of V. And so for the intersection can't be empty, but the intersection could be the zero vector or it could be more. Um, if, it's the, if it is happens to be that the intersection is just the zero vector, then we give this a special name. Then what we say is that U is the direct sum of the, not just sum, but the direct sum of W1 and W2. And we have actually a special notation for it too. We write U is W1 plus, uh, in tech it's O plus, um, uh, W2. Um, so with, with a circle around the plus uh, to denote that we have more information. Not U is not just um, elements of W1 and W2 added together, but we also know that W1 intersection W2 um, is, the, is the zero vector. That, that also, for example, means that um, you can write elements of uh, U in only one way as a linear combination, uh, as, as a sum of something in W1 and W2. Every element in U, uh, you can't find two different ways of writing it. Uh, um, but, uh, but, but I'm not gonna go get into that. So as a very simple example, if these are two, just two dimensional plane, and if you pick W1 to be the span of one zero, that's the X axis. And if you pick W2 to be the span of zero one, that's the Y axis. Then um, R2, W1 plus R, W2 is the span of those, which is all of R2. So R2 is the sum of W1 plus W2, but the intersection of these is just the zero vector, zero, zero. And so, um, so R2 is the direct sum of the X axis and the Y axis. Okay. Um, now we want to go and talk about, um, uh, we want to talk about how W1 intersection W2 and W1 plus W2 are related. So we have V, uh, we have W1 and W2, we have the intersection, um, the part that's common to both of them. And now we found, um, uh, we have also found uh, W1 plus W2, which is not the union, is more than the union. Um, and we want to know, is there a relationship between these uh, different subspaces that we have. So now here we have four subspaces of V, W1, W2, W1 intersection, W2, and W1 plus W2. And um, the theorem is that if you're in a finite dimensional vector space, if you're not in a finite dimensional vector space, then you can't, some of these things might be infinite and then uh, we can't do arithmetic with them or at least not, uh, uh, not at this level. Okay, so V is a finite dimensional vector, vector space. We have subspaces of V, I'm just repeating myself. Then here's the important theorem. The dimension, what's the dimension? The size of a basis. We proved in a previous lecture that all bases for a vector space have the same size. Then that size is called the dimension. Um, and what's a basis? A set of vectors that spans, but it's also linearly independent. Does the spanning as efficiently as possible. So the dimension of W1 plus W2, the number of elements in the basis for W1 plus W2 is the same as the dimension of W1 plus the dimension of W2 
minus the dimension of the intersection. You might say, well, this is just a Venn diagram. Well, the Venn diagram tells you about things about the number of elements. The number of elements in these things, for example, if these are vector spaces over R, if the scalars are R, are infinite. All of them are infinite. W1 plus W2, uh, all of them could be. W1 intersection, W2 could be zero. I mean, it, some of these could be just a zero vector, but that would be dull. Um, and if you are in, in, a, in a vector space over a finite field, then this could be finite uh, uh, vector spaces. You could count a number of elements. And the Venn diagram would tell you that the number of elements in W1 plus W2, if it's finite, is the same as the number of elements in W1. Uh, actually, it wouldn't tell you that uh, because the way I've drawn it, W1 plus W2 is actually bigger. So, so this is something just about dimensions. Uh, uh, okay, so, so, so this doesn't just follow from looking at the Venn diagram is what I'm telling you. Um, uh, there's content to it. This is actually an interesting theorem and the proof is also very interesting. I'm going to sketch the proof for you. So I'm going to tell you um, how this proof is done, um, but, um, but I'm not going to actually tell you to write it in, in complete detail. And there's going to be one part that I'm, um, that, that's actually hard, which, which I want to leave for homework for my students. So, so what's, the, what's the idea? Um, so, so we have our, our situation. We have W1 intersection W2, W1, W2, and W1. In a plus W2. So we start with by picking a basis for the intersection, the smallest of all of them. So, so, so you pick a basis for uh, the intersection of W1 and W2. Um, and, um, and, uh, and then what we do is that this is the sort of the clever part of this proof is to start with W1 intersection W2. I'll say a word about that in a second. Then what you do. So, so you, you, tip, you pick a basis for that, let's call that B. Then you use our extension theorem, um, our expansion theorem, sorry, and, and expand B to a basis for W1. Um, um, B is a set of linearly independent vectors. It's actually a basis for W1 intersection W2, but it's not necessarily a basis for W1, but it is linearly independent in W1. And whenever you have a set of linearly independent vectors by the expansion theorem, subject of a previous video, um, you can extend that to a basis for all of W. So, so what that means is that you find a set S so that B together with S is a basis for W1. And, and it's not just the union, they, they don't have any things. You just put together the elements of S and B. When I say the union that it, you, might, you might think that, okay, if some elements of S and B are the same, for example, well, the union will um, uh, not just take one of those. No, B and S are going to be actually distinct sets. And, and then when you, you put them together, you'll get a basis for W. This was the subject of the expansion theorem. You can always do that. You might think that you could do it the other way around. Start with a basis for W1 and say, well, some of those elements are going to be a basis for W1 intersection W2. That does not have to be true. Uh, you could have a basis for W1 and such that the, um, within it, uh, when you look, you don't find a basis for W1 intersection W2 at all. Um, uh, you, you might want to find an example of that. Um, so, so, so to be able, but, but you can do that. But to do that, this is the way you do it. You start with W1 intersection W2, you find a basis for it, and then you expand it to a basis for W1. And then you um, uh, do this again. This time you start with B, which is a basis for W1 intersection W2, and expand it to a basis for W2. So that means that, again, you find a set T that's disjoint from B, and so that the union is a basis for W2. Then what you do is, and this is actually the harder part of the, uh, the, the proof, is to show that the S union B union T is, a linearly, is linearly independent, that, um, that these elements cannot be linearly dependent. And, and, and basically what you do is that you say, well, if there is a linear dependence, then uh, by moving things around, um, you will find things that are uh, going to be something that's going to be uh, both in uh, W1 and W2, W2, then it should, should be written in terms of B, and that will lead you um, to um, a contradiction um, uh, in, in terms of things, uh, the things that you already know are linearly independent, but I'm leaving that to you. And so if it's a, it's a linearly independent, um, and from the stuff we have said before, it will also span, it will be a basis for W1 
plus W2. I'm not filling in the details there, leaving them to, to, for you. And so if you do that, again, that step four is the hard step. The other ones just follow from the stuff we have done before. Um, that fourth step um, is, is, is what you will need to do. Then a dimension of W1 will be the, the size of B plus the size of S. And dimension of W2 will be the size of B plus size of T. Uh, dimension of W1 intersection W2 will be the size of B. And then if you look at the dimension of W1 plus W2, well, S union B union T was a basis for it. So, so the, its size is the size of S plus size of B plus size of T, but then we're done. Because if you see what we wanted to prove, if you take the um, dimension of W1, which was, was the size of B plus size of S and add it to the dim dimension of W2, which is size of B plus size of T, you get an extra size of B and then you have to subtract, but that's the dimension of W1 intersection W2. If you take that out, you get this. This is an example of what you might call the inclusion exclusion principle. And um, um, so now I'm gonna give you one quick example of how you would use this. This, this is a very useful theorem, but, but uh, here's just one, uh, one uh, quick example of how you might use that. Let's say you walk into a five dimensional space and you, you know, you're right, walking around, you, you're trying to figure out what kind of substructures there are. Is there anything you can, you, you can hang your coat on? And you find uh, two subspaces that are three dimensional. And actually you like three dimensional subspaces. You know how to live in them. So you'd see W1 and W2. Uh, they're two different ones. They're not the same. They might have intersection, but, but they're two different three dimensional spaces. And then you ask yourself, but what can I say about W1 intersection W2? Um, um, could these be two very different worlds, three-dimensional worlds with nothing in common other than the zero vector? Or uh, do they have to have some, something in common? And, and this is very abstract. I don't know what the five-dimensional space is, and I don't know what the subspaces are, but I want to be able to say something about W1 intersection W2. And, and the question is not asking me anything about W1 plus W2, but that will be helpful. So what I say is that, what can I say about the dimension of W1 plus W2? Remember, W1 plus W2 contains both W1 and W2. Well, because it contains W1, it has to be at least three-dimensional, can't be smaller than that, but it also contains W2. And W2 has elements that are not in W1 because they're distinct. Those elements in W2 that are not in W1 cannot be generated by a basis from W1 because those guys, any linear combination will just give you W1. So um, when you have W1 plus W2, you need some other elements um, in your basis for W1 plus W2, uh, some other elements other than uh, uh, stuff in the basis of uh, W1. And so the dimension is going to be at least four. And it can't be five because V is five dimensional. It can't go outside. So, so you know that the dimension of W1 plus W2 from this scant information I gave you, you can't quite tell which one, but it's either four or five. I mean, if, if you want, more, you know, you're hoping for five because you like more room, but, but it might be four. But then you can say that I know that the dimension of W1 intersection W2, rewriting the, the formula we had, is the same as the dimension of W1 plus dimension of W2 minus the dimension of W1 plus W2. And the dimension of W1 is three, dimension of W2 is three, and the dimension of W1 intersection W2 is either four or five. So then that tells us that the dimension of W1 intersection W2 is either two or one. So it can't be, um, uh, it can't be zero. It can't be that uh, you just have the zero subspace. Um, 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 it, 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 and, um, and it can't be three. They can't, I mean, they, we knew they weren't three because they were distinct, but we now know that, uh, um, the, the intersection has dimension one or two. This is the end of this lecture. And um, in subsequent lectures, we will be starting to uh, seriously talk about matrices and their relations, uh, the matrix multiplication first, but then their relations to vector spaces. And we will use our vector space knowledge to analyze matrices in future lectures. Keep hydrated and see you next time.